Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about a salt marsh. If you look behind me, you can see a beautiful salt marsh that fringes Weeks Bay. And salt marshes are just low coastal grasslands that are frequently flooded. Now the marsh can be divided into zones depending on their elevation in the marsh and how frequently that area is flooded. The low marsh is lowest in elevation and closest to the water, so it's flooded regularly by the daily tides. And the plants that you find here have to be adapted to having their feet wet continually. The high marsh is behind the low marsh. It's slightly higher in elevation, but it is irregularly flooded. And, uh, usually only flooded when we have storm surges or really really high tides and then the land beyond the high marsh just transitions into forested area. Now the marsh is extremely important for the health of our estuaries and our bays. The grasses are able to hold that marsh soil together thus preventing erosion especially when we have storm surges. The grasses also are able to filter sediment and break down pollution, keeping them out of our bays and estuaries. Juvenile shrimp and fish and crabs are able to swim up into those flooded marshes and find food and protection, but larger animals use these marshes as a place to find food and shelter. And with us today, we have Rick O'Connor. Rick is a biology teacher at Washington High School in Escambia County, Florida, and he and his students do research on diamondback terrapins. And Rick, you have a terrapin with you today, don't you? Yes, we you? do. Yes, we do. This is a uh, spot. This is a male diamondback terrapin. Uh, the terrapins are salt marsh animals. Uh, they prefer brackish water. They're exclusively brackish. They don't venture into fresh water or the ocean very often. Uh, our friends along the East Coast probably see quite a few of these in the Chesapeake Bay area, but along the Gulf Coast, they're rare. It's hard to find them. There's pockets of populations all along the Gulf Coast here. They like the grass, uh, the creeks that move through the grass are the areas that they prefer. Uh, they spend all their lives in those creeks and don't venture very far from them. Uh, it's breeding season right now. They're actually up on the beaches nesting, and what they need for nesting are sandy areas along, along the, uh, the springs and the, and the uh, creeks along these and they'll lay six to 10 eggs a couple of times during the year. Now this is a male. Uh, the one we have here is known as the Mississippi Diamondback. Uh, he won't get much larger than this. The female is maybe about twice the size of this one. Uh, these animals are having a tough time along the Gulf Coast. Uh, primarily uh, habitat loss, uh, dredge and fill of the, uh, the marshes has been a real problem for them. Uh, another issue that we're having is uh, the crab traps. Uh, a lot of the crab traps, these animals tend to swim into them and being reptiles, unfortunately they can't breathe and so they tend to drown in them. Uh, there are some traps uh, that have modified um, um, devices that you can put on side of the, to keep the terrapins from moving in and, uh, and along the east coast they're using those quite a bit and we're trying to get more of those used here along the gulf coast. Well would you like to show one of those traps? Yeah, I think we have some sure. up front. All right, these are what we will call a derelict or ghost trap. These are traps that are left in the bay and aren't actually fished. And these are, are real problems here because no one's actually watching. There's all kinds of animals that get caught in these things and drown. So uh, we're trying to have all of these removed. And in Florida, there are trap removal days. This is a crab trap that has the device that we're talking about called a BIRDS, a bycatch reduction device. Uh, you can see the size of it, uh, basically a mirror size from a car and you can do it uh, horizontally or vertically. Uh, there's experiments going on right now trying to decide which design works best. The big problem is the females are the ones that go in. The males tend to follow. So if you can keep the females out, then the males tend to stay out as well. And a study up in the Chesapeake area showed that not only did this help keep terrapins out of the trap, it actually improved the number and size of crabs they were catching there. So it's a good idea. Thank you, Rick. You're Now joining us is Susan Clemen. She is a biologist at the Environmental Studies Center, which is part of Mobile County Public School System. And Susan has a brown pelican with her. And brown pelican is a unique story. It's one of our success stories. Uh, the brown pelican was once listed as endangered, but now has been delisted. And uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about the success of our brown pelicans? Well, basically what happened with the brown pelicans was back in the 70s, they noticed the population was getting lower and studies were done and they found out that there was a chemical that farmers were using as a pesticide called DDT. And this DDT was act actually, a f it was getting into the water, fish were ingesting it, and of course pelicans eat fish. And the DDT was affecting the shells of the pelicans' eggs. 
and so the shells were actually breaking before the babies could hatch, and of course that's going to cause a population depletion. Right. So as soon as it was discovered what it was what was causing the problem, they banned its use, and and after that, then their population grew quite a bit. Wonderful. Yeah. And uh, can you just tell us a little bit about pelicans, what they do out here in the marsh? Well, let me introduce. This is Goody. Okay. Goody, Goody is our brown pelican, and the reason that we have her is because she came to us wrapped up in fishing line. Fishing mm -hmm. line is a horrible thing if it gets, you know, if it's found just loose and in piles in the water. And she had wrapped up her wing in fishing line and she had broke her wing trying to get out of the fishing line. So when she came to us, her, she was wrapped up, broken wing, and it was so badly damaged that she could not be returned to the wild. So that's why we have her. Um, brown pelicans, really cool birds. Um, first thing everybody notices is the beak. We have a very long, funny looking beak here. It's used to catch fish, that's what they eat. They actually dive into the water head first, scoop the fish up with the beak. They have that the skin underneath their beak called a pouch that can expand. It can hold, hold over a gallon of water. They, they don't have teeth, so they actually swallow their fish whole. And um, they also have webbed feet for swimming, kind of like a duck. This is another adaptation that they have. They don't have an external nose like we do. They just have, their nose is literally in their mouth. They have their trachea inside of their pouch that allows them to breathe. And of course, when they have water or food in their, be in their mouth, they can close off that trachea. So they're cool birds, real cool. Well, do you have any suggestions for our audience for what they should do if they find injured wildlife? Well, <laughs> first of all, you know, you always have to be careful. Wildlife can be very dangerous. Pelicans, the dangerous part of them is that beak. You know, they've got a very point a sharp point in the end and they can reach out and you know pierce you pretty badly so you always want to get that head covered and that's how it is with most wildlife cover the body with a sheet or a towel and that calms them down okay yeah well thank you so much